Welcome back to Face the Nation and our conversation with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. Let's talk about the other agreement. Uh, the House is set, Democratic-controlled House, is set to vote on the USMCA, the free trade deal with Mexico and Canada that's been rewritten. Um, this is a, a win for the president to get this through, but uh, Speaker Pelosi and her caucus uh, did have some last-minute maneuvers here. Uh, Speaker Pelosi is quoted as saying, we ate their lunch when it comes to the Trump administration. So How do you respond a, to that? We had a great... Uh, you made some concessions to labor here. That well, was not insignificant, so, and it so, did irk some Republicans. So, so, so let, me, let me make a point about that. We had an election, and the Democrats won the House, number one. Number two, it was always my plan, and I was criticized for this, as you know, it was always my plan that this should be a Trump trade policy. And a Trump trade policy is going to get a lot of Democratic support. Remember, most of these working people voted for the president of the United States. These are, these are not his enemies. So what did we concede on? We conceded on biologics, yes. That was a move a away from what I wanted, for sure. But labor enforcement? There's nothing about being against labor enforcement. That's Republican. The president wants Mexico to enforce its labor laws. He doesn't want American manufacturing workers to have to compete with people who are, who are operating in, uh, in, in, in very difficult conditions. So there's... But look you at, don't think there's a political cost? Because uh, Republican senators were annoyed to be cut out of this last week. There, there are always process issues. This bill is better now, with the exception of biologics, which is a big exception. With the exception of biologics, it's more enforceable, and it's better for American workers and American manufacturers and, and, and agriculture workers than it was before, for sure. Mr. Lighthizer, thank you very much thank for joining for us. Me. And we'll be right back with a lot more Face the Nation. Stay with us. CBS News has been polling Americans on the impeachment inquiry ever since it was opened. And today we have a new poll. It shows that even after the testimony and debate over the articles of impeachment in the House committee, still less than half, 46 percent of Americans, feel that the president deserves to be impeached over his actions related to Ukraine versus 39 percent who say he does not and 15 percent say it is too soon to say. Joining us to talk about what's happening here and also give us uh, some insight into the race for the Democratic presidential nomination are CBS News Elections and Surveys Director Anthony Salvanto and CBS News political correspondent Ed O'Keefe. Good to have you both here. Good to see you. Thanks. So, Anthony, it looks like no clear winner to this argument. No dramatic movement on those numbers. And this week we asked, in particular, do you find these arguments convincing that it was abuse of power that the Democrats are making? And that comes out split. Do you find that the argument that the president obstructed Congress convincing and, the, and people are split? So it's a mixed bag here. And I want to emphasize, it's not that people in the poll feel that what allegedly went on was proper. They don't. And they do find the Democratic arguments a little more convincing than the Republican ones. And on that particular question, people are just sticking to party line votes. I think the way this has tracked the whole way is that views on impeachment are more or less just related to whether or not you think the president is doing a good job in the first place. Ed, Speaker Pelosi was reluctant to start impeachment in the first place. There is a political cost to all of this. Have we calculated what it'll be? Well, you know, it seems to be minimal. I've been struck by the fact that all of these vulnerable Democratic freshmen have essentially held firm on this issue. And I think this number here proves it, that if you voted for a Democrat last year, you're for impeachment. Therefore, there's enough support for them back home, so long as Congress is doing other things, which is why we're going to see them pass the trade deal this week, make sure the government keeps the lights on, uh, is working on issues like prescription drug prices. The only fallout, and if this is the only fallout, it's telling, is this Congressman Jeff Van Drew from southern New Jersey is essentially, or we're told, probably going to switch from being a Democrat to a Republican in the coming days. It's a Republican district. He's taken some hits back home for it. And the party showed him some internal polling that found because he voted against starting the impeachment inquiry, his support among Democratic voters bottomed out. So he's just going to roll the dice as he might in Atlantic City in his district mm -hmm. and going to switch to become a Republican. But, but if that's it... Democrats probably in good shape. And ultimately, we, we know Democrats with the majority are going to 
vote to impeach. Yes. No, this isn't going to change any yeah. kind of math there. Let's take a look now at the Democrats running for president in 2020. Our new battleground tracker poll surveyed likely Democratic voters in the March 3rd primaries. That's Super Tuesday. And there are 14 contests. Close to a third of the delegates will be decided on that day. It is key. The top tier here, not a surprise. Former Vice President Joe Biden is on top with 28% of voters' support. Senators Elizabeth Warren right behind him at 25%, with Bernie Sanders at 20%. But we do have a new candidate in our second tier. After South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg, who has 9% support, former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg comes in at 4%. With entrepreneur Andrew Yang, Senators Amy Klobuchar, Cory Booker tied with 3% support, and the rest of the field comes in with 2% or less. So, Anthony, this was a gamble for Michael Bloomberg. Does this mean so far it's paying off? Well, it's key, Super Tuesday, not just for the big delegate hall you mentioned, but because that's where Michael Bloomberg is trying to enter this race, coming in after those early contests of, say, Iowa and New Hampshire. Now, you mentioned that he's in fifth place. One of the things that's interesting is you look at this and you see the Democratic Party a lot through the lens of his entry, which is to say, if you look at the liberal side of the Democratic Party, people who are more inclined to support Elizabeth Warren, support Bernie Sanders, they look at his entry and they say, well, it shows that wealthy people might have too, in, too much influence in politics. But he's pulling a little bit more from Joe Biden, a little bit more from Pete Buttigieg, and moderates are more inclined to look at that and say, well, it means he's independent from big donors, all that spending that he's doing there. So you see that and you see him doing a little bit better, a little bit better, with people who say that the party is going in too liberal of a direction. The trouble for him, of course, is that that's not most Democrats. Most Democrats think the party is just about right in its campaign direction. And this was a unique strategy for Bloomberg. Is it paying off? Well, it is risky, but he can afford to do it, uh, you know, being a multi-billionaire. And, 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 you know, if you're already at 4% and you still have a little more than two months to go and you're advertising as much as he is and you're now traveling to these states and you're not devoting time and resources to those first four states but instead going to focus on these 14, what's to say that he doesn't at least hit the delegate threshold of 15% in some of these states and pick off enough delegates to keep going and remain a factor in the race. I was struck he held an event across the river here in Northern Virginia on Friday. A uh, handful of people. His events have been quite small so far, mostly because they're tied to the organizations he's worked with in the past, climate control groups, mm -hmm. gun control, mayors. This one had about 100 people, and I asked a few folks on their way out, why are you here, how did you find out about it? They heard about it from local Democrats, they're intrigued. He seems a little more charismatic than we thought. Clearly, he'd be an effective manager which after a few years of Donald Trump, these Democrats said, wouldn't be a bad thing. So we'll see. He's got time. Somebody has to test the theory that right. the first four states perhaps get too much influence. He certainly can afford to try. But yeah. An okay. Anthony, last time we talked, you said voters were satisfied. Democrats were satisfied with the field of candidates. Now they've got more options. And I think this relates to that strategy too, in that we went ahead and asked people, what are you in these Super Tuesday states, California, Texas, et cetera, going to make of the results out of Iowa, out of New Hampshire. And half of them said that they use that to narrow their choices, that they use that specifically to see who is a contender. Well, that's a hurdle for anybody who tries to get in late. But at the same time, I think Bloomberg is trying to bet on the idea that there might be reticence coming out of those early states, maybe build on that idea that the party was going in too liberal a direction. There's nervousness. And then there's nervousness, and that's another thing that we found. We asked people, well, how do you feel about just watching this whole campaign unfold? And more people said that they felt nervous than felt optimistic about it. And specifically, electability, the idea that one of these candidates can go ahead and beat Donald Trump next fall, there's no single candidate that a majority of Democrats says is probably going to beat Donald Trump. Joe Biden does relatively best on it, but it's still not most. Ed, he buried the lead. Yeah. No Democrat here <laughs> is viewed as being able to beat Donald Trump. Right, and that that's was Bloomberg's, that's Bloomberg's theory of the race too, that because nobody else can do it, why shouldn't I at least try? And so he'll try. Thanks to both of you, gentlemen. It's time now for some political analysis. Dan Balls is chief correspondent at The Washington Post. Kelsey Snell is a congressional reporter at NPR. Edward Wong is a diplomatic and international correspondent for The New York Times. And David French is senior editor at The Dispatch. Welcome to the program. 
Good to have all of you here. This is going to be an incredible week for you, Kelsey. You got, <laughs> you've got some significant votes teed up, not just impeachment, but this trade vote, and as Ed laid out, keeping the lights on in government. Yes. Since we taped that interview with the trade representative, Mexico has now said they're flying here and they have object objections to what was supposed to be a real win for the president. Yeah. Is that vote or any of these votes in jeopardy? Last time I talked to leadership Democrats, they say that the vote is on and that they expect things to go as planned. But again, these are late breaking developments that may be changing their plans. They really do feel the need though to get this done before they leave for Christmas. They have a large number of particularly these battleground Democrats who need this trade deal so they can go home and say, I didn't just show up and impeach the president, I also got you things you care about. And is this, David, this entire impeachment vote, I mean, you have written that Republican strategy here is largely just to base it on hypothetical defenses of the president rather than the facts. Right, right. It's Republicans aren't taking him seriously or literally. They're taking him hypothetically, as a, a friend of mine, uh, Adam White, wrote. Uh, and what's happening is they're saying, well, there's a way in which it could possibly be okay to investigate Ukraine. Pay no attention to the transcript. But there's a way in which it could be possibly okay to investigate corruption in Ukraine. There were individual Ukrainians who did things in 2016. But this doesn't bear any resemblance to the kind of investigation or the subjects of the investigation that Trump himself pressed the Ukrainians on. And I think one thing that uh, rank-and-file Republicans it has not penetrated to them at all is this idea that when Trump was talking about investigating 2016, he was talking about investigating a very wild conspiracy theory, one that would put an ally in an impossible position. How does an ally disprove a conspiracy theory that is dear to the president's heart when an ally needs hundreds of millions of dollars of military aid? And that... that and you're talking there about drawing into question the intelligence community's conclusion that Russia interfered in 2016. Well, and quite specifically, finding a mythical CrowdStrike server in the territory of Ukraine. This is a crazy conspiracy theory, and it's something that I think calls into question the president's fitness. And it's gotten less attention than the Biden angle, but I think it's very important to understand the president's state of mind as he conducts international diplomacy. But it has drawn Republicans into the conversation to have to sort of also defend that portion of it a little bit. I mean, you had senators like Ted Cruz and others have to say, well, there was meddling by someone who was Ukrainian, therefore the president has merit to his conspiracies. Is there any political price to any of what we have learned here, Dan? Well, there, 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 there could be some political price on both sides, I think. I mean, we know, as Kelsey said, that there are vulnerable Democrats in swing districts who, you know, could feel some pain from this. We're not clear on that, but, um, but I think that there are also Republicans who could feel this once we get through it. I mean, I talked to a Democratic strategist recently who made the argument that um, once you get into re-election campaigns, that some of these senators who are up in 2020 um, will pay for what they have done in defending the president so vociferously without giving any suggestion that he did something wrong. So even if we are headed to a Senate trial with an, essentially an acquittal, not, not a vote to remove the president, that this could backfire? Potentially, yes. I mean, it, it, it goes to the question of um, how these senators explain their votes, particularly the Republican senators, uh, to acquit. Uh, do they say he did something improper, but it doesn't rise to the level of impeachment? Or do they say he did something egregious, um, but we're X number of months away from an election and therefore let the voters decide, as opposed to saying what he did warrants removal from office. I think their words will be will be used against them depending on how they handle it. And Kelsey, quickly, are there any defections or any other party changes we should be expecting? <laughs> other than uh, <laughs> Jeff Andrew, who already was mentioned by uh, Ed O'Keefe, we are not hearing about any other major defections. I would expect that there will be in the neighborhood of maybe three, four, five Democrats who uh, vote against impeachment. That's, that wouldn't be a surprise if there are a few of them that do go that direction. Don't really expect any Republicans to switch because one of the things that Republicans tell me all the time is that the president is popular with most Republican voters. And the ones where he isn't popular, mm -hmm. they're just not showing up to vote. It's not a matter of they're going to vote against uh, these members for a Democrat. They're just not going to show up. Ed, I want to ask you about the president's centerpiece foreign policy issue, and that is trying to broker a breakthrough with North Korea to end the threat of their nuclear program. North Korea just carried out another test Friday. Right, and I think what 
the president's very nervous about is North Korea possibly testing a nuclear warhead or an ICBM that might reach America, uh, would have that distance of reaching America. And I think that this... In the coming weeks. Right, in the coming weeks. Um, Kim Jong-un and his um, officials have said they'll deliver a Christmas gift to President Trump if Trump doesn't come up with a proposal mainly to, um, to take off sanctions from North Korea that would please Pyongyang. And I think that this will, um, pre you see the president getting nervous. He's been tweeting about this. He says, don't try and undermine my chances in the 2020 election by doing this. And he knows that if these tests take place, they'll undermine one of his main diplomatic selling points to his supporters, which is that he got North Korea to, to quiet down on the testing. And this breakthrough on the trade deal, uh, it's a smaller deal than what the president promised with China. Does that intersect here in any way? Does China become more helpful in trying to deliver North Korea to the table, or is there no connection? I think they've, um, from what I've been told, diplomats have managed to keep it very compartmentalized. The North Korea policy track has been separate from the trade negotiation track. Um, the trade deal that you're talking about, uh, what is interesting about it is that it doesn't address any of the large structural changes that the president wanted to see um, or that he was trying to tell his voters that he would get from China when he started this whole trade war. And in fact, um, you see China has this command economy structure that has capitalist elements that it will continue to use and that uh, nothing in this phase one deal, which is considered a weak deal by many experts, addresses any of those um, aspects. And as you reported today in the New York Times, there was a significant espionage attempt on U.S. soil by China. Right. This is an interesting case because uh, for the first time in more than 30 years, it looks like the U.S. expelled two Chinese diplomats um, who they believe were spies. And they, these um, spies or diplomats tried to drive onto a very sensitive military base in Virginia, a base that had special operations forces on it. And, um, and then they were caught and mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, pushed out of the country. The main question about this is whether it'll add to the ongoing U.S.-China tensions and whether it'll become um, a point of conflict within the diplomatic relations. There was a significant report in the Washington Post this week, Dan, um, detailing uh, real miscalculations, misleading in many ways, um, of the public by a series of U.S. administrations about the war in Afghanistan. Um, I asked Senator Lindsey Graham about it, and I want to play a, a bite for you here. Well, to be honest with you, I know General Petraeus pretty well. I never thought I was sugar-coated about Afghanistan. Has it been mismanaged? Yes. Yeah. money been wasted? Absolutely. Is President Trump right to demand that Afghanistan do more and we pay less? Is President Trump right for NATO and the region to pay more in Afghanistan? Absolutely. Is he right to withdraw some of our forces? Yes. But we can't leave Afghanistan until this time, the time is right. International terrorism will come back. We're spending a lot of money in Afghanistan without a lot to show for it. I think we need to change that policy. Dan, how's the story getting buried? How are there not congressional hearings being called? I, I totally agree with that question, and I think that it's unfortunate that there has not been more attention outside of what the Post has done, and our, my colleague Craig Whitlock spearheaded this project. Um, it, it's more than sugarcoating, as Senator Graham suggested. I mean, this is deliberate misleading of the American people on a grand scale, um, and it's there in the documents in the in the after-action reports that the government conducted itself. Um, I, I think that it's in part because we're in the middle of this impeachment proceeding, and it has absorbed all of the attention and taken all the oxygen um, in the you know in the media. But um, I have to think that at some point that it's going to come back, and there will be some major questions that have to be answered, both on Capitol Hill and p perhaps along the campaign trail. And you uh, agree with that, David, because it seems to be popular with Democrats to also promise bring the troops back right. home. And yet you saw this attack on a U.S. base in Afghanistan this week. Uh, Senator Graham said to me that he thinks talks with the Taliban should be called off until there's a ceasefire. Yet the Trump administration is saying they'll just pause them right now. Right. Well, you know, I think what we have is a politicians on both parties have a real problem, and the problem is the American people have competing desires. One is to end the wars. The other one is to keep America safe. And the problem is when you look at the emerging threats from international terrorism and what suppresses those threats and that Amer American military has been pretty successful at suppressing threats since 9-11 here at home, 
but that has meant involvement overseas. And if you've got, you can't have both. You can't say we need to keep America safe the way have, we have since 9-11 and bring everybody home. Those are irreconcilable objectives that the American people have put before politicians. And I fear to connect it with the Afghanistan uh, papers, what you end up having is a Pentagon contorting and twisting mm -hmm. the truth in the pursuit of things that it can't necessarily fully accomplish. And the entire strategic picture has becomes a political and strategic mess. I mean, just to remind people, we're expecting to bring troops down to 8,600, but there's still 12,000 Americans there. And, it, it, and it, no hearings called as yet, Kelsey. I, I wanna ask you as well about another big election overseas or referendum overseas in the UK. Uh, Brexit, very confusing, but boiling it down. <laughs> Conservatives won, Boris Johnson staying, UK is leaving the EU. Those are the certainties that we know of right now. What's the bottom line here uh, that Americans need to know about Brexit? Well, I think a lot of Americans will be looking at this and wondering whether it, they can draw lessons for the 2020 elections here in America based on this and based on the larger issues of sovereignty and um, immigration and other issues that come up with Brexit. But I think that we should keep in mind that Jeremy Corbyn was widely disliked by many British the voters. Labour candidate. Right, even people who would traditionally vote Labour. And so I think it's, um, it's hard to draw that parallel because uh, right now, none of the Democratic candidates have draw, uh, like inspired that amount of dislike here in America. <laughs> Dan, do you, do you agree with that? I do agree with that. I mean, I think there is a question that the Democrats are asking themselves, which is how, how far left can we go and not be at risk in a general election? And I think that those uh, who are most vociferous to saying we have to be careful about that will take what happened in Britain and use it as an argument along the campaign trail. Um, parallels are a little bit different because of the Brexit overlay in this case, but the wipeout of the Labor Party, I mean, it's, I mean, it's the worst they've done since the 1930s. So um, obviously Corbyn was a factor in that, but there's also a factor that, that, the, that the working class vote there uh, the abandoned them. Vote right. in some ways. The populist working class vote abandoned Labor uh, in, in droves and in districts where they've had uh, strength for nearly a century. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much for breaking down another significant week here in the nation's capital. We will be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you all for watching. And we'd like to thank Jack Morton Worldwide. They designed and created our new set. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.